All right, we are really excited to be joined again by Sandy Stotsky for what I think is a very critically important conversation we've been having about civics literacy, about history teaching, and about uh, what our teachers, and this is what we're going to focus on today, are being compelled to do over and above having to be responsible for teaching kids literacy. And that, Sandy, is what we see in Illinois. It's a prototype in Illinois, but there have already been gestures in other states towards this. They're called culturally responsible standards, not for kids, but for teachers. And they're Orwellian. Uh, they, in, they require, absolutely mandate that teachers have to acknowledge their bias, especially if they're white. White teachers must acknowledge their bias. They must admit that systemic racism exists. They must admit that they participate in uh, privilege because of the systemic racism. They must analyze their behavior in very graphic ways. They must come up with written plans about how they're going to minimize their racism. They must commit to a situation where they're going to spend their time fighting against their own racism. I mean, this goes on for page after page after page before you get anywhere near what the kids have to do or what, what any of this has to do with actual learning. Right. And what is ironic about this is that the kids who are actually flourishing in our schools everywhere, Asian American children, don't have teachers like them and are not being asked to talk about privilege. So here they are doing better than every other group, but they're not being subjected to these peculiar kinds of standards or edicts that have been coming from national level and from the local level as well. It's a great point with Asian Americans. I mean, uh, Joe Biden, one of the first things he did as president was cancel the ongoing lawsuit against Yale. The federal government was in the process of suing Yale University for discriminating against Asian kids who are just doing too well. Biden killed that, right? And so two questions you got to ask yourself. Why, as you mentioned, why are Asian Americans doing so well as a minority group uh, without necessarily having to sit around and whine and cry about privilege and systemic this and systemic that? And number two, uh, why is does the, do, do American progressives not recognize Asians American, Asian Americans as minorities who are actually doing well. That is puzzling and certainly must be of a great puzzlement uh, that comes from the King and I uh, to a lot of Asian American parents who make sure their kids take education seriously, study hard, go to school every day, and their kids don't need teachers who look like them. So why, are, why do we have to have this whole thrust for what I, some people see as catering to the low achiever who doesn't come to school every day? We know what attendance records are. And who, for some reason, this may have a difficulty relating to the fact that most of their teachers are white. They always have been. That doesn't seem to bother Asian Americans, and it didn't bother any of the other European American groups when they came to this country during the 19th century, early 20th century. So what gives? Why is it that privilege is the issue? I think we need to find out why people think that kids need to attack this notion of white privilege when it doesn't seem to bother all kids. We even know that when Jaime Escalante in California was teaching calculus, it, white privilege didn't enter into the situation. He just made the kids work. He disciplined them. They learned to discipline themselves. And they all did well in a very, very tough math course. So we need to think about why is it that it can be done if you have strong teachers who insist upon disciplining the kids who come to school prepared and come to school every day. I once looked into attendance records and I am really shocked. I feel very strongly that teachers get a bad deal when the kids aren't there every day. 
Well, I That's actually think it, I actually think it's cultural, but it's it's not cultural systemic racism. It's cultures where moms and dads there there's not a mom and dad in the home. You got single mothers who are work, busting their butts working in the in the real world to be able to oversee what their kids doing. You've got children who are not coming to class, who are not paying attention, who are disbehave misbehaving in the classroom, who aren't interested. And so I think what's happened here is as you as you've known for 60 years, we've tried to uplift the lowest performers, many of whom are ethnically diverse, many of them are inner city, many of them are African American. Uh, they remain the lowest demographic with regards to academic success. A success. So I think what's happened is, is as as was Common Core wa warned us it was going to do, we're no longer going to look at low performing kids as the problem. The problem is, is that the schools are the problem, the teachers are the problem, white supremacy is the problem, Eurocentrism is the problem. Everything's the yeah, problem. Security is the problem. It, yes. And how do you do anything with the community except lock them up? Maybe lockdown is part of mm -hmm. locking up this white privileged community, but the kids don't do any better. They want to get back into school. They just can't get back into lockdown schools. And people have got to realize that. We've got some serious contradictions to work out if we expect to help low achievers. But as you've been suggesting, it may be that the goalposts have changed. Maybe higher achievement is not the aim of a lot of the projects today in the schools, that there are other aims that relate to behavioral attitudes, but we haven't seen that that's made a difference either. But let's talk about Illinois now and what they expect to see is Chicago going to have higher achieving children now that the teachers are going to be willing to teach them in their class? Well, Illinois, I, we're back. To, we're back to Illinois where those standards are being proposed. And the burden, what gets me about this, uh, Sandy, the burden of learning is not on the kid. It's not on the kid and it's not on the kid's culture. It's on everybody else. The teachers got to get their acts together. The teachers have to swear oaths to be anti-racist. The teachers have to go through some kind of quasi-therapeutic prog program to atone for and admit their bias and their prejudice. Now, you and I both know none of that's going to help kids. Not any aspect of that is going to get kid, any kid one step closer to being able to read and write. Not one. All this is is a way of getting teachers to realize realize that their job is not to teach, their career is not about education, this is about modeling how the, the new progressive state wants certain racial classes to apologize and to kowtow. If it's more than that, tell me, or, or other than that from your perspective, Sandy, tell me what you think about it. First of all, I think they, whoever has created this idea that they're of cultural responsiveness needs to think about why, if they, these kids have come from a particular culture that may not be that favorable to kids doing well in school, and this has been going on now for half a century, by now we would know whether the culture has favored the kids or not. We certainly know that there are cultural responses that could be made to Asian American kids, but they're all positive. You work hard and you practice and you get ahead. Why doesn't that work for other groups? Is there something else going on that we've got to think about? I don't see local school boards doing what they should be doing, exploring why certain groups are not flourishing in their schools. And Chicago is a prime example to start with. Why are the scores so low in Chicago? Former Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, came from Chicago, and it isn't as if he had accomplished anything in the Chicago schools before he was put into the Department of Education. We have a similar problem to worry about with the currently nominated, and I think he was just in a, a, few day, a few days ago, I think he was approved, uh, Miguel Cardona. He comes from Connecticut, and there is no record of his having done anything similar to what Jaime Escalante did 
at a high school that was very Hispanic in California. So what is going on? Is it that we have white privileged teachers in all schools that are keeping certain groups down? I mean, we've got to stop looking to find blame somewhere and look to see where we have little pockets, even if they're tiny pockets, but little pockets of achievement and build on them. Now, but blame, well, I, but blame Sandy, is a way of avoiding those questions. We, for 50 years, we've struggled, and I'm gonna call it what it is, for 50 years, we've struggled with increasingly progressive norms when it comes to educating kids. More politics, more ideology, more money, uh, less responsibility, less rec accountability, bigger, te bigger, safer teachers unions. These are all progressive and progressive initiatives. They don't work. They don't work because, as you just said, it's not about the basics. It's not about discipline, respect, attitude, and hard work. All of those things now have been labeled white supremacy. They've been all labeled uh, uh, white systemic racism. The idea that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, we're told, is racist. The idea that math is about right answers or that the scientific method is politically neutral, all those things are considered white supremacy. All the establishment- So homework too. And homework. I don't oh. understand that one. Pra homework is practice. Yeah. And everyone, including sports, music, any area you name, Everyone knows that practice is what all kids need in any subjects. Right. So, so homework why is, is that privilege. So homework is racist. But when a kid, a, a, an aspiring young African American athlete, spends hours and hours and hours on his football re regimen, that's what? That's that's not racism. Right. The whole thing is. So I guess what I'm saying to you, and I, this is where I want to ask you the final question. I don't see this changing. I don't see us getting fixed because the attitude and the uh, ideas, the ideology is all wrong. There's nothing that shows us that we as a country, that the government, that the teachers union, that the teachers themselves, we have no evidence that we want to change the paradigm. So given that it seems like for the, the foreseeable future, ideology is going to be what drives our schools. My question to you right. is, as somebody who's dealt with teachers a lot in your life, connected to teachers very much, why would teachers sign up for this? If you were a teacher in Illinois and you were told you have to sign this manifesto, you have to spend three hours a week in counseling for your racial superiority, would you do it? What would you do? You are getting a very lower level of teacher who would be willing to put up with that kind of interaction. I'm not going to use an obscene word here, but that's what it would be called by parents and teachers who can see straight or think straight. It isn't going to do the kids any good. The school system is going to go down. It'll, it's plateauing downward. It may just stay at a low level, which is where a lot of these kids are, or else it'll get even worse. But that's part of our national problem. What do we do if we have nothing but children who can barely read and write, if at all, when they are in high school? Do we give them diplomas? I mean, you're asking what's going to happen in a sense to the functioning of anything at all when we don't have students prepared, capable of organizing something that is effective and doing well So for them. So what are we going to do? Look, I, I think, I, I think we, we have a lot of history in the world that shows when successful countries transition to allowing uh, large swaths of minority populations to run things, it doesn't go very well. I mean, unless you are training Americans of all colors in, at, in a systemic way to value achievement, to value success, to value knowledge, if you're not doing that, if, if homework is sinful and attendance is unnecessary, uh, you don't, my thought, my final thought for you is that we don't have a school system anymore. Whatever the, they're doing in the public school system, no, it, isn't, it is not I education. Agree. 
that I agree. We've lost our public schools. And while there are many virtues in having a public school system, it seems that private schools, whether they're sectarian or non-sectarian, are open, they're involving personal instruction in their classrooms regularly. So kids are able to learn in private settings, but you have a lot of people worried about what's going to happen if we have a failed public school system. What will we do with the children who don't have opportunities to go to any of these private settings for instruction? And that is a serious issue. We don't know unless we can straighten out somehow with the help of the unions, if they are now going to be in the middle of curriculum, which is not what unions were originally set up to be. That is something that has been puzzling to me for a long time. Who should be helping to create the kind of cur the curriculum in K-12 that kids should be able to have. In the 19th century, it was the local community because all the funds for the schools came from the local community. I think we need to think about how to go back maybe 200 years or at least a good 150 years to see whether we can reconstruct the ability or the capacity of the local community to shape what it wants to offer the children who are now living in that community and going to its schools. That to me is where I would start. We've got to get somehow a reduction of the strings that have been tied by the federal government and that Congress can do at any time, president can do. I don't know how we can reconstruct a public school system that functions when we don't allow it to function. Yeah, and my final thought about this is, you said going back to local communities. Can you imagine what a curriculum would look like if we put some of these Asian immigrant moms and dads in charge of the curriculum? You would have a high focus on math and science. You would have a very low focus on ideology. You would have high reading kids. You would have a remarkable musical program in that school. Would that be such a bad thing? Actually, a good right. performing arts program right. would be wonderful. I have seen and interacted when I went to a music camp during the summers for many years with students who went to the performing arts high school in Washington, D.C. and in other places. They were wonderful. This was what they wanted, but they had to audition and they have to practice. There is no question. They just can't sail through and they can't skip classes. They have to show up and they have to be there and they have to practice. All of the things that we're being told are white privilege, but that isn't going to help us today with ed schools who, if they belong to a state university, get their money from a state legislature, he who controls the, the purse strings should be the, the piper calls the tune. He who pays, whatever that little saying is, is where you want to work on, but we're not doing it very well because we're paying and getting very little for our money's worth. Well, I will say this by way of signing off. We, you wouldn't trust the government with your money. You wouldn't trust the government with your freedom. You wouldn't trust the government with a lot of things. Why do you trust them with the school, your school kids, particularly in this environment? Sandy, let's do this. We've had a couple of good series back to back. Take a little break now. Uh, and I think maybe in the fall, when we have a chance to see what Commissioner Cardona does do, we'll get back together when school starts in the fall and we'll assess what exactly the Biden education policy is now turned into.